I am uh, pleased to introduce our first speaker this morning, Nisha Talagawa from Fusion IO. Nisha is lead architect at Fusion IO, where she works on innovation in non-volatile memory technologies and applications. Nisha has more than 10 years of expertise in software development, distributed systems, storage and IO solutions, and non-volatile memory. Nisha earned her PhD at UC Berkeley, where she did research on clusters and distributed storage. And she holds more than 30 patents in distributed systems, networking, storage, performance, and non-volatile memory. Please join me in welcoming Nisha to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking with you about Flash, non-volatile memories, and you know what we can do with Flash and non-volatile memories to improve MySQL and databases. So, so first of all, you know, just a kind of a very brief preview of what is you know kind of currently state of the art in the land of non-volatile memory. So first of all, there are several different kinds of non-volatile memory, but primarily what is shipping today and what people can you know, use and deploy today is the particular type of flash called NAND. This, uh, you know, these days comes in hundreds of gigabytes to up as much as 10 terabytes per device. The trend is generally you know, not in, you know, it's more in the consumer kind of trend rather than necessarily the enterprise trend. So the trends are basically towards higher capacity, lower cost per gigabyte, actually lower endurance, and so a lot of the you know, work that Flash you know, vendors like Fusion IO do is take lower quality raw you know, parts that were designed to be used for consumer devices and then add to them you know, technology and reliability and other things to make them enterprise grade you know, products for the enterprise markets. So there are basically you know, several different kinds of Flash and they you know, start with things like single level cell, which is about 100,000 write cycles, then the dominant flash that's today is multi-layer cell, which is anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 you know, write cycles. And then what's emerging is an even lower cost, even lower endurance form, which is more of what's called the three bit per cell or the triple layer cell kind of things. So what you see there is basically a progression in the direction of cheaper, bigger, not necessarily faster, and definitely not as reliable, you know, at least at the media level. You know, but still, you know, flash vendors have been able to take these raw media and convert them into actually products that have hundreds of thousands to millions of IOPS and many gigabytes per second of bandwidth. What's coming up in the land of you know, non-volatile memory is equally exciting. There's a lot of different you know, technologies lining up to replace flash. There's PCM, MRAM, you know, STT RAM, and so forth. Most of these are still in research. They're starting to emerge in the consumer market for cell phones and things like that. But they're a few years out with respect to what they might be able to do in more of the you know, classic kind of server side space. So now, um, why Flash for databases? So, so Flash is a really good match for databases. I mean, Flash is a performance medium. It is you know, a form of storage that you use if you're performance sensitive, as most databases are. It's a low latency medium, so you can actually get you know, much better throughput with a lot few, smaller I.O. depth. And it happens to handle a mix of sequential and random workloads much better than disk. So disks are you know, so much slower because of the movement of the disk arm that you really, they do very, very well on sequential I.O., not so well on random I.O. So if you look at you know, Flash and you compare it with a disk drive, so the first thing that you notice is that these days the capacity is about the same. They're not that much different. You know, the IOPS, on the other hand, are much different. So you can get you know, much more IOPS with the same amount of capacity of Flash as you can get, than you can get with a disk drive. So, you know, flash is still more expensive than disk, you know, quite reasonably more expensive. But if you think about it from the point of view of the IOPS, the amount of money that you pay per IOP for the same capacity of flash is a lot lower in the flash space. So the key to deploying flash effectively is to kind of understand this trade-off and then put it in, you know, put the flash in places where it matters and it results in an overall, you know, cheaper infrastructure if you use it carefully. So kind of with that in mind, you know, what, what we were going to talk about today is you know, the, the way that flash usage has evolved and how we see, at, particularly at Fusion I.O., how we see it continuing to evolve. 
So the first you know, usage is a flash, and I'm just gonna put these two as, you know, you know, in kind of the same bucket from the, you know, from the point of view of uh, how we think about them. The first usage of flash were really as a fast disk drive. And this is a really important usage because this is the usage that fueled pretty much every you know, um, consumer of flash you know, until very recently. And it is you know, where all of the value of flash in, in you know, databases and others have come from to date. And that is to see it as a fast disk. And you see it either as a fast disk that replaced your other disk, or you see it as a fast disk that is the top tier of your storage hierarchy. You know, you've got you know, your really fast disk, which is made up of flash. You've got you know, somewhat slower disk made up of actual HDD, and then you go. So, you know, so this is very useful, but it is really seeing the world as a fast disk. Now, if you look at you know, sort of the next phase of it, you know, now you've gotten you know, a lot of value from you know, using the flash as a fast disk. Now you want to see the flash as something that is really its own thing, that it is not really a disk drive. It you know, actually has always been a very different animal. And as the technology underneath gets cheaper and denser, it becomes yet more like, you know, you know, kind of different from disk in that it really has to be managed in a very flash specific kind of way. So this is what we call flash beyond disk, where still an I.O. model, you still do reads and writes, but uh, you kind of recognize that it's not really a disk drive and really never has been. The next phase of this, which I will simply mention here as a, um, you know, just to kind of complete the picture, but we won't really talk about much today, is the convergence of flash and memory. And this is, you know, so, so the simplest way to think about this is the presence of a really fast I.O. medium means that you can usually get away with a lot less DRAM in the system. So you're creating sort of a merge where you know, the flash is taking on some of the role of DRAM. If you look at the futures of non-volatile memory, this becomes even more profound because the next generations of non-volatile memory actually have a lot lower latency. So they are actually a lot closer to memory than even the flash is. So this is sort of the, kind of the natural sort of evolution we see of flash usage. And what this you know, kind of tracks to is first of all, you, know, you want to go for better transactions per dollar per watt. So it's not just about getting more performance, it's about getting more performance for the money, getting more performance for every unit of power that you put in, and things like that. And typically what this means is that software and applications become more aware of the medium, as in they tend to do things that are more specific and friendly to the medium underneath. So going from left to right, you you know, get better flash awareness, which is the primary theme of the talk today. And with the better flash awareness, you get you know, better cost effectiveness or better transactions per dollar per watt. So the first phase of this is flash as a fast disk. And so you basically you know, replace the disk drive that you had with a disk drive that's 10 to 100 times faster, and now you tune. And this has been going on for several years now, and the results have been very impressive. So, I mean, and the kinds of things that, you know, got done in this sort of bucket is place your data carefully. You know, place the data that is, you know, needs the random IOPS on the flash. Place the data that doesn't need the random IOPS so much on the disk. Place data that's latency sensitive on flash. Put the rest of it on disk. Recognize the fact that flash has no disk arm. Therefore, you know, complicated algorithms in the kernel that try to optimize around the disk arm are pretty much useless. All they do is take up latency, turn them off. You know, anything that implied a seek, turn that off. Read ahead is usually not a good idea with flash because it was there to you know, support the rotation of a disk drive and that doesn't occur anymore. Everything is much more parallel now. So you know, try to remove locks, try to remove you know, any concurrency bottlenecks in your software and things like that. The block I.O. stack itself you know, had some limitations, and over the last few years, this has improved quite substantially. So there's um, you know, some work that has been going on in the last year particularly, where the block I.O. stack has now been pushed up to several million IOPS, merely by improving its queuing, its parallelism, and things like that. And these are starting to find their way into the mainstream kernels. And then find the fastest file system. You know, and so there's lots of studies out there of which is faster, XFS, extended four, under which cases, things like that. This uh, graphic that I showed is actually a somewhat older graphic, but that actually is what makes it interesting. It's one of the first uh, studies done by some of our solutions architects at Fusion IO that shows the difference between tuning and not tuning. 
So in the red line, you have non-optimized, non-tuned. The blue line, you have same database, just with the right parameters. And you can see the levels of improvement that you can get. The second part of you know, using Flash as a fast disk is finding a way to use all the IOPS. So the thing with Flash is that Flash gets its IOPS from how many Flash die you put on the device. And every die is a somewhat independent entity. And so the highest IOPS of Flash typically come at a fairly high queue depth. You know, there are things you can do to improve latency, but after a while, you know, when you see a device that has hundreds of thousands of IOPS, a million IOPS, that typically occurs at a fairly high queue depth. And so in the interim where your application, a single instance of it may not be able to scale to all of the available you know, I.O. depth, then a short way that you can get to use all the IOPS is to run multiple instances. So here, for example, if you take the same flash device and you run one instance, you get the same, a certain number of transactions. You run two instances, you get roughly twice as many transactions. You run four instances, now you get about 50% more transactions than the two instance case. So it does level off after a while, but this is a, you know, a simple way that you can you know, get to soak up all the IOPS that the device has anyway. So now, you know, those are the things that you do to do, use Flash as a fast disk. So now we'll look at you know, what does it mean to look at Flash beyond disk. So these are some of the areas where you can see how Flash is actually different from a hard disk drive. So the first thing is, in a hard disk drive, read and write performance is mostly symmetrical. You, know, you get kind of the same number of IOPS in both cases. In Flash, they are heavily asymmetrical and getting more and more so with every generation. They also, Flash also has an additional operation called erase, where every time that you write something, you cannot write to that same location again unless you perform this erase operation. And the erase operation is several milliseconds and gets slower with every cheaper version of Flash. So this is just not like a disk drive when it comes to the, the pattern and how the device responds to that pattern. Sequential versus random performance. You know, there's a 100x difference in hard disk drives. In Flash devices, there is a difference, but it comes from the behavior of the Flash translation layer and is typically less than 10x. You know, background operations are rare in spinning disks. They are normal operation in Flash devices. So if you have used your Flash device for any length of time, it will be doing background data migration pretty much continuously after a while. And, if, and your ability to manage the occurrence of that and the effectiveness of that you know, has, goes a long way towards what you will see as performance in the steady state. Wear out is not really a factor in disk drives. It is a factor in you know, Flash devices. And again, another case where Every you know, generation of flash that arrives that becomes cheaper and cheaper also has less and less wear capability attached to it. And then the performance obviously is a lot better. So recognizing this, what can we do you know, to create more of a flash aware sort of stack? And so at Fusion IO and with our partners, the approach that we've taken is sort of um, kind of an approach where I'll start from sort of the bottom of this stack, which is, so you have the flash device, and it does read and write I.O. the same way that any disk would. But then you basically supplement and complement those operations with a set of what we call primitives, which are capabilities surfaced up by the device that allow you to sort of both access and control these very flash unique aspects. And we've defined a set of primitives. There's a fairly small set. It's something like five, you know, of which you know, three are, for example, in heavy use. And we define these primitives, and we surface them up from the device. Then comes the file systems. In file systems, you can either exploit these primitives for the file system's own benefit, so that the file system gets faster, more efficient. And you can also export these primitives up to applications so that the applications can become more flash aware and do things that are smarter and more intelligent with the underlying device. And so on this front, you know, we, you know, at the flash layer, we've introduced a number of primitives, and I'll talk about some of them in turn. You know, examples are Atomics, which is transactional writing, uh, Ptrim, which is a persistent and uh, transactionally deterministic form of the trim operation. 
at the file system layer, you know, there's work underway to, you know, both um, adopt as well as, you know, um, support these primitives inside the file systems that's happening in the open source community. We've also introduced a file system designed at Fusion IO called NVMFS, which is hyper-optimized for this kind of, you know, use case. At the MySQL level, you know, um, we and our partners at, you know, MariaDB, Percona, and Oracle have generated, you know, uh, database technologies that have uh, exploited and benefited from some of these capabilities. Could you move one slide back, please? Thank you. So in the Flash Aware API integration, um, yesterday, you know, we were very happy that, you know, all three of our partners, or Oracle, MariaDB, and Percona announced collaborations with, with us to develop these Flash Aware capabilities inside the database, and they, you know, all three of the partners have code you know, at various stages of release that incorporate uh, two different uh, you know, efficiency enhancement based on these primitives. So let's talk first about atomic writes. So what are atomic writes? So if you think about disk drives, you know, disk drives, uh, when you perform a write to a disk drive, particularly a write that's more than one sector, those writes are not guaranteed to be transactionally safe. So if you have a, a power failure that occurs in the middle of a write, by classic storage standards, the device is allowed to write all of the old data, all of the new data, any arbitrary combination of the old and new data, or for that matter, any third pattern entirely. And so, you know, applications have traditionally protected themselves from this feature of storage devices by performing various forms of journaling, or in the case of MySQL and the other databases, the um, the, the double write buffer. So you want to make sure that your writes are written serially, first into one place, secondly into a second place, so that if a failure occurs somewhere, you've either got a completely clean copy of either the old data or the new data that you can refer to. So with atomic writes, what we do is we enable, ensure that every write to the flash device is actually fully transactionally correct, which means that it will only do, if there's a failure, you will only have a perfect version of the old data or a perfect version of the new data. So what this means is that at a database level, you can now disable the double write capability. Now, this gives you the most benefit if your atomic writes are as fast as your other writes. Because if your atomic writes were slower, then maybe it wasn't, isn't such a big, you know, a good thing to just use those. But it turns out that in Flash, because Flash is unable to write at the same place again and again anyway because of the way that the media is defined, you actually have a perfect copy of the old data lying around somewhere. So it's mostly a matter of just recognizing that this has value and exporting it as a primitive that people can use. So in our flash devices, for example, atomic writes are as fast as regular writes. There is no notable or even measurable necessarily performance delta between the two of them. So with that in mind, so here's you know, an example of, some, of a performance possibility. So what you have on this slide is um, you know, performance with double write disabled, which is much higher performance, but obviously the database is not transactionally safe, or the performance that you get for a transactionally safe production grade database that is employing the double writes. And this is without atomic writes. If you turn on atomic writes, what you get is you get the performance that you would have gotten with the double write disabled, but you have all the transactional safety that the technique was providing you. So the additional benefit of doing something like this is that you actually end up writing about, on, about half of what you would have written to the flash you know, in previous circumstances. So you would essentially get a 2x de device level improvement in endurance. And this is actually very important because it allows you to use the upcoming you know, uh, flash technologies much more effectively because they tend to not be able to write as much as the previous technologies, so now you can use them for longer because the application got smarter and doesn't write nearly as much. So this is a, an additional improvement of the atomic writes, and this is the latency improvement. So this is with Percona server, and it's with Sysbench. And what you can see is that you know, the predictability of performance, and this is the 99th percentile latency, is substantially improved when you write less. And part of this is because it's actually doing a lot less I.O., 
And part of it is because doing a lot less writing to Flash results in Flash doing a lot less garbage collection, which then overall improves the predictability of, of the behavior in steady state. So, so this is another you know, kind of improvement that you get by using the atomic writes. So moving from atomic writes, so uh, the, the second capability in Flash Aware um, databases that we announced yesterday was uh, NVM compression. And so the idea here is to do compression in a way that is very friendly to the Flash and keeps up with the performance that is inherently possible from Flash devices in, you know, in the many hundreds of thousands of IOPS, but also leverages some of the unique capabilities of the medium, so being Flash aware. So the uh, architecture that we have here is you have a Flash device, in this case, our IO memory. There's you know, uh, capabilities that are in the file system that are, you know, that are there to speed up some of the compression operations. And then you have the database that is then you know, um, employing a different form of compression call, that we call page compression. So, so the basic idea here is to utilize the natural thin provisioning of the underlying flash. So if you think about the way that compression works, so anytime you take a block and you try to compress it, it becomes a different size every time because it depends on what data was actually in the block. So any application or any piece of software that does compression ends up with a data packing problem. Because now, you know, first time I compressed my data, it became three and a half kilobytes. So I found a three and a half kilobytes place to put it. Next time I compress it, it is now 5.5 kilobytes. So my old place doesn't fit anymore. Now I have to find a new place. And then I have a hole left over where the old stuff used to be, and now I have to find a way to garbage collect and compact that hole. So what NVM compression does is recognize that this problem is very similar, if not identical, to the problem that flash devices do solve on a regular basis by doing garbage collection. So rather than having this kind of packing happening at the application and then again at the flash, we expose more of the thin provisioning capabilities of the flash and have the application just dump data into scattered, sparse sections of virtual space and trusting that the holes in between will be efficiently garbage collected by the flash anyway. So what does this mean? This means there's no packing or repacking or rearranging of bits at MySQL, no rebalancing, no compression failures, or any of those kinds of things. So you can have a very simple piece of code at the database level. There are, this results in holes inside the file, you know, because now the database is putting data into a sparse file. Those holes are in, you know, described as you know, trim operations. They are unmapped. And then that tells the flash device that there's actually nothing there that's useful, and it will basically uh, garbage collect around it. In addition to this, you can combine this with atomics as well as you know, improve the flushing operations inside the database to make them multi-threaded so that you know, the overhead of actually doing compression, because that actually is a pass over the data with some computation, can be parallelized over the many available cores. Uh, one of the benefits of this kind of an approach is that you can now use pluggable compression algorithms. So you can actually have a different compression algorithm for every data block, if you like, or a different algorithm for every table or every file, because there is pretty much no relationship between what you do at a block level and what you do for the other block. Because the, you know, from the application's point of view, it's just compressed and dumped into virtual space. From the device's point of view, all it sees are a set of writes and a set of holes and it just garbage collects through them as it normally would have. So what does the performance of this look like? So this is a, a sample of the performance improvement, and this is with the link bench workload. So what you have um, on the left side is the transaction rate uh, of the link bench with uncompressed. What you have in the middle bar is the transaction rate of the same link bench with standard uh, row compression where you essentially get about a fifth of the performance that you would have gotten uncompressed. With NVM compression, you get about 90% of the performance that you would have gotten with the uncompressed. And part of the reason for this is that it's a combination of sort of two things. If you can do the compression fast enough and simply enough at the application level, then at the device level, you end up writing a lot less. When you write a lot less, over time, the flash is actually far more effective than if you had written a lot more. So if you look at the first bar versus the third bar, 
In the third bar, the flash is receiving about one-fourth the writes because the combination of the compression and the atomic writes means it's writing a lot less. So the flash is performing better, and the compression mechanism in the database is simple enough that it can keep up. And so that's the reason why you get you know, nearly the speed of uncompressed, and in some cases with what our uh, partners have seen, sometimes even performance slightly better than uncompressed, driven entirely by the fact that you're writing less. So this is the performance for a you know, OLTP workload similar to TPCC. This is with MariaDB. And you know, what you show, have there is the compressed uh, performance with row compression is within 5 to 10% of the performance of uncompressed. It is you know, about 5x better, or there's an 86% or so degradation in going from uncompressed to row compressed. And you don't see that degree of degradation or anything close to it when you run with page compression. Now let's talk a little bit about capacity efficiency and endurance. So the NVM compression is actually architecturally more storage efficient than row compression. And this is mostly due to the fact that in the row compression architecture, you always compress to from a 16 kilobyte block to an eight kilobyte block. So your maximal efficiency is 50% just by design. In the you know, NVM compression, you compress from the 16 kilobytes to whatever sector multiple that it results in. And so if your data is compressible from 16 kilobytes down to one sector, that is the efficiency you will get. So architecturally, the page compression or NVM compression is, will always be as good, and then depending on the data that you have, possibly even better than the standard row compression. In the case of the, um, the link bench uh, run from previously, the efficiency that you get with um, row compression was about 49%, and the efficiency you get with the NVM compression is about 58%. So you have the potential of actually saving more of your storage space. You know, the endurance improvement, which is you know, very important again for the you know, upcoming versions of Flash, is about 4x. So it will write about 4x less on average than the uncompressed case. So now speak a bit about file system support. So at the database level, all of the uh, NVM compression code only uses POSIX compliant interfaces. So it is not using a custom interface. These are existing you know, interfaces defined. The interfaces are here. I'm not gonna go over each of them, but they are mostly there to enable the writing of the atomic IO, as well as the ability to punch holes in the file to indicate the presence of you know, empty spaces of data that the device can later garbage collect. Now, the, your ability to get this to you know, run as efficiently as possible depends on the file system's ability to convert these POSIX-compliant you know, interfaces into efficient you know, implementations at the underlying layer. And so this is where you know, NVMFS has been specifically tuned to do this. And so you, know, you can get a lot of speed of the NVM compression by using NVMFS. So a few comments on NVMFS. So NVMFS is, uh, stands for Non-Volatile Memory File System. It's a POSIX-compliant file system designed by Fusion I.O. for Flash devices as well as devices that come after Flash, you know, that are more in the memory space. It, you know, is basically intended to be very, very friendly to Flash. So it, you know, supports database workloads that are, that are its first focus very well. It pre-allocates large files. It's very friendly to the Flash translation layer underneath. So one of the things that you notice when you are dealing with Flash is the performance of the devices is so fast that file system effects like, the, like fragmentation and aging that normally took days and months and years to manifest in HDDs, they manifest in hours in Flash devices. And so one of the kind of the features of NVMFS is that it really has no fragmentation problem and has no aging with the, you know, or performance degradation as the file system accumulates more and more IOs. So its performance will stay consistent. And it, uh, you know, then, and the part of that is because of the way that it uses the flash underneath. And the same technique means that it actually, you know, is, is fully transactionally secure, you know, at, from, at every IO, which means that you don't really need an FSCK, for example, if you had a crash. And it provides nearly raw flash speeds for IO operations and for various forms of primitives. So um, another final thing that I'll leave you guys with is that um, 
uh, in order to encourage people to develop and exchange ideas and prototype and things like that around flash awareness. Last year, we created a, a project on GitHub. This is also a sub-project of Open Compute called OpenNVM. You'll find a bunch of code there. Some of it is related to our primitives. Some of it is actually related to some NoSQL stuff, as well as you know, changes that are being rolled into the Linux kernel. And so folks who are interested can go there and take a look at the code. And if you'd like to contribute stuff, you, know, you can do that there as well. The, uh, these particular Flash Aware features, Atomics and NVM compression, are available uh, through MariaDB, through Oracle MySQL, through Pocona, and there are some releases here that show what releases and where to get the code in each of the cases. NVMFS is available for early access, so you can contact, you know, go by the Fusion I.O. booth if you're interested in doing that. Um, there's a bunch of talks here at Procona Live. This is a little non-timely because most of these talks happened yesterday, so I'm not going to ask you to go and listen to the talks, but if you want to find them online, this is where they are, and there's a number of blogs you know, out there as well. So I think that's all I had.